Welcome to Talking In Stations. I am Matterall. It is March 24th, and uh, we're already getting close to the end of the month. We're here to talk about some EVE Online. Let's go into what uh, we collected for you here at Talking In Stations Discord. Kind of an interesting news day uh, all around because we've had uh, some disruptions in uh, Reddit. We can talk a little bit about why that was turned off today, which is very unusual. At least uh, our Eve was. Um, there's also news about yesterday's snuff fight that was happening as we were on air. Looks like uh, snuff lost uh, Titan and uh, was definitely a dread brawl going on there. Uh, there's a few other things too. Let's have a look here. Uh, oh, just some Horde Fleet stuff and uh, just some funny bits. Also, if we have time, we'll talk about just to scrape the surface, an uh, interview that Hilmar did called The Metaverse is Coming, Are You Ready? Really interesting interview there with CCP Hilmar, the CEO of the company that makes EVE Online. When he talks, we tend to listen because it informs our expectations for what's going to happen in EVE Online. Let's get started. All right, first we'll start with a little fun stuff. I like this one. This is, I believe, Pandemic Horde. And uh, this is their latest fleet formation. I believe it's a happy face. Or, uh, I don't know. yeah, maybe uh, uh, Apple or Macintosh uh, symbol. I don't know, but that's their latest formation there. Pretty funny. That looks like it's coming out of F2O. And that was as recent as today. I think they're actually fighting right now, um, but uh, we're not going to do much war news today. We'll catch up on all that tomorrow. What we will do is have a look at uh, what happened yesterday in Maya. Uh, that is in every shore. Let's actually see if we can't get there and show you where it is on the map so you can have a better idea of what we're talking about. Every shore is actually a, uh, like a little mining region that um, I used to live in. Other people used to, you know, spend a lot of time in it. It's high sec. It's pretty safe. It is um, got a little bit of low sec, which is dangerous because people know that miners live there, so they'll stock those uh, low sec systems for easy prey. I think I got my first Hulk killed in uh, in low sec uh, every shore. But uh, this Maya system is a little bit of a dead end system. Uh, you can see it here on the map. Let's zoom in on that. Um, so that is where this fight went down that happened uh, yesterday. Uh, you can see it was mostly dock workers and uh, with 82 combatants uh, and snuffed out with 120. Um, but they did bring in, dock workers did, Purple Helmet Warriors, which is basically Wrecking Crew. Uh, Wrecking Crew is uh, the coalition, but the Purple Helmet Warriors is the alliance. And uh, also Siege Green uh, was in there as well. Siege Green's notable because they are a counterweight to Snuff in that they are very cap capable Korean players, uh, low sec dedicated. And um, this is not their time zone. So them coming into this fight is a bit early for them. <clears throat> Normally, they're Australian time zone uh, because that's where uh, Korea is. It's near Australian's time zone. I hope that's clear. Uh, but they were fighting in late U.S. time zone or actually U.S. time zone. So this fight went against Snuff, which is unusual. It was a 400 billion isk fight. And uh, Snuff got the worst of it, losing 240 of it. Uh, that accounts for the Titan, but also a lot of dreads. You'll see here the uh, avatar went down. But if we investigate further, there's a ton of dreads. So it really became uh, a, a tale of dread, dreadnoughts destroying each other. Uh, dreadnoughts of choice these days are revelations. You can see both sides using revelations. And of course, uh, the group that took out the Titan is going to lose dreadnoughts because uh, they're shooting one. They're shooting one very, very dense ship, while many ships are shooting many of their ships. So 
uh, you're going to see a lot more destruction there. And that's why a lot of those revelations are gone. But in the end, they managed to uh, uh, at least win on the ISK war. Not a big problem for Snuff, but it is a warning shot. I think that they that there is no walk in the park when you have RC and dock workers and Siege Green, freight train diplomacy kind of working together. Uh, what I don't see here is Min Mitar uh, faction war people uh, who might also jump in and help out. Of course, they're not anywhere near Min Mitar space at this time, but the point is it seems like a few groups have kind of gotten together to be a counterweight against Snuff, even in Snuff's U.S. time zone. Uh, Snuff is usually pretty strong in their EU time zone, not their U.S. time zone. But um, uh, this is an example of that, I suppose. We do have a little bit of video here. This is by Doc Workers, I believe. Yep. We'll play a little bit of it. I'm going to speed it up to double speed and turn off the sound so we can talk over it. Uh, I'll, I'll actually make this bigger if I can. That's probably not the way to do it. One thing I wanted to just note here, I'm not going to describe what's happening in, in this fight because it'd be very difficult for me and I'd get a lot of things probably incorrect, but I just want to look at it as a scientific experiment because as you can see, there is a ton of um, uh, people fighting. Again, this is them sped up quite a bit. Uh, it's at least probably four times normal speed. And uh, it just looks to me like cellular combat. You know, like if we're looking at red blood cells attacking something, or not attacking, or white blood cells attacking like some kind of a virus or something, you'll see how, how they move. Uh, to me, it just looks like plasma, you know, inside of a vein or something. I don't know. I thought it was pretty interesting. It looked very organic is what I'm saying. So uh, interestingly enough, when we zoom out of this game, we see almost like a, it's like a microcosm. Uh, on the right-hand side, I believe uh, the purple there are going to be dock worker. Um, dock worker. I think those are revelations those are dreadnoughts they're firing here on the left uh, that looked to me like probably the intended target which is the avatar that's probably bumped off uh, the structure or something like that uh, this we'll see this clear up in just a minute but uh, oh there comes some doomsdays coming down um and those are those are probably snuff uh titans up there Oh, here's a counter jump there on the left. You see they're neutral to this group, but they are probably working together. Uh, oh, there goes a the revelation bumped off. This is, oh no, that is snuff. That is the intended target. That is the avatar that is being targeted. Uh, interestingly, it's not red. It doesn't look like it's red. It looks like it is neutral to this group. Uh, there you see Doomsday going off at what looks like a fax. You want to clear fax, which are repair ships for dreadnoughts. If you start shooting at dreadnoughts right away and they're being repaired, you're going to find that you're swimming upstream. So you need to destroy logistics and repair ships first and then go after dreadnoughts unless you can alpha dreadnoughts right off. And you're seeing a lot of what looks like snuff repair ships. All those fax machines there, that looks like. Fax is for force auxiliary, fax for short. It's actually F-A-U-X, faux, but uh, that didn't take very well. Fax is what it, it ended up being. But those force auxiliaries dumped right on top of that Titan trying to save it. This is not live footage. This is recorded, so don't get too excited. It's not happening right now. Uh, but we're looking at the snuff fight that happened in Maya. That is every shore, the region of every shore inside of high sec space or empire space. This is low sec, though. This is a 0.4 system. Uh, this footage is from uh, dock worker perspective. So the color, the colors, the red being the enemies, the grays being the neutrals, and the purples being their own fleet. Um, that is from the dock worker's perspective. Those big beams there, of course, being uh, doomsday shots from dreadnoughts, sorry, from uh, titans, which are over on the left-hand side. We're zoomed past them now. This fight's moving at like incredible speeds, but uh, as you can see, this, this particular fighter here, 
I imagine is in a dreadnought and they are clearing dreads as quickly as possible, it looks like. A different group went to work on that Titan, but they're, this is a, a dread on dread kind of fight. Uh, let's see. We'll go until we see the avatar explode, which uh, should be relatively soon. They actually did attack a second Titan from Snuff. As you can see, a lot of Titans from Snuff were out there, uh, but those managed to jump out. There was one that actually got injured pretty well before it was able to jump out. Um, but yeah, Doomsday's all over the place. Like there's no messing around on this one. Oh, there goes a big explosion. And that might have been the Avatar. We'll see if that group keeps fighting and then we'll know. Yeah, sorry things are going super fast. Is that, does that like uh, totally throw you guys off? Because I, I, I kind of need to watch it at this speed so that I don't uh, waste too much time. So I'm used to uh, watching things go super fast. Of course, this is an actual player. You can tell him because he's targeting stuff. So what he's doing is adjusting his camera for his actual game performance, not for observation. But uh, that's, oh, that is a big explosion. That is probably, um, can't tell, fax machine probably. Any capital ship is going to have an explosion that lights up the entire screen. So if you're ever watching an an EVE Online fight and you see the screen light up, that's a capital ship. Those are much bigger, have a lot more mass than normal ships. Uh, and and uh, I think Titans have very particular explosions as well. Uh, you can see, we're almost done here. We'll just play it out till the end, but it looks like that avatar is already dead. And now it's really just an issue. Uh, uh, it's really just a slugfest. The damage is going so fast I can't actually read it. But I believe you're just seeing those Titans rain in on those uh, Dreadnoughts and Faxes, Doomsdaying, those green lights. Those are all Doomsdays. Now, it's interesting. When you fight in low sec, in numbers like this, everything's happening relatively fast. I mean, I'll, I'll bring it back down to normal. Let's see if we can get normal speed. Well, at least, oh, that is normal speed. Okay. So the author of this video actually sped it up. Um, but I can see that there is no tie-dye on that video. So what that tells me is that um, you're fighting at a pretty fast pace there. Decisions have to be made really quickly. And that's that's a lot, a lot of quick calculating that has to be done by risk assessment, um, escalation paths. All that stuff has to be calculated by the FC. The fleet commander, the people making the call to say jump reinforcements in or no cut losses and bail. Uh, all that all that stuff has to happen real time. When you're fighting in major, major fights where thousands of people are involved, everything slows down and you can take a little more time to assess your situation. Uh, so low sec has its own beauty in that things are happening fast. So your adrenaline is really going all the time really fast. Sometimes in null sec, things are happening so slow. I know there was a lot at stake, but my heart was like a very calm 60, you know, or whatever. It was like relaxed. Uh, but when you're fighting like this, it's pretty fast. Yeah, Battle Report, I showed that earlier. It's a 400 billion ISK fight. Uh, the snuffed out team lost 240 billion of that 400, but they took out 172 on their way. So that's what happened there on that fight. Again, Maya which is interesting because I don't know, this might have been, I don't know what they were fighting over. It could have been a structure of some sort. I think Siege Green actually defended successfully a structure against uh, Snuff. So there are probably some structures here, but they're used as um, strategic basis to be able to jump. Uh, and again, if, if you're going to jump, you're really just jumping these low-sex systems, but it could be a midpoint to get you past the region into a different region. Um, again, this is mostly a mining colony, so I'll show you around here. Down here is uh, good connections to Gel, which used to be a um, system that had a lot of missioners go through it. Uh, you have ice mining in these two areas, which is nice. I believe there was a market in, I want to say it was uh, either Atlantis or Verant, I think, also had one. Uh, Olight is a nice little system. It's a little island of high sec, uh, but all around you is low sec. So uh, what's nice is <laughs> CCP tempted you with the station that could do research 
and manufacturing and invention. So a lot of people would want to move into the system, but you have to get there through two low sec system and that's very dangerous. So a lot of people get uh, plucked. Uh, going up here, you go into sink lay zone into an industrial area in sink lay zone. So that's kind of nice if you want to live in a light uh, and do some PI in low sec and, and uh, move over to the industrial area, you could do that. Um, up here is the Dodixie area. So if you're here, you're like two or three jumps from Dodixie, which is very handy. Over here, I think RVB used to live in this uh, constellation here. So they had e easy access with no, no gates. So they could literally uh, fight and flee and maneuver if they wanted to. I don't know if that's what RVB did. That's usually, you know, 1v1 at the sun kind of stuff. But, but RVB was corporations actually fighting each other. So this had good um, geography. And that gives you some interesting decisions to make, what gate to go through, what angle to attack in. So that's why they lived here for a short time. They've lived all over EVE Online. Um, mining happens up here. We'll switch over to belts. You can have a look at uh, belts here. Uh, there's some really good ones. Actually, it's right here in Genesis. This uh, let's Zoom in here. I always said this wrong, but Garanaf Garanafa has uh, a bunch of belts. If you jump over, you'll be in Genesis, one region over, but it has like 21 belts, which is kind of nice. So if you go back to every shore, this is one of my, one of my early and favorite regions. Um, I don't know how to say that one. <coughs> Ayudo or something? Uh, Aydotato. I'm, I'm just... Uh, uh, I said it and I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> Toli is where I used to hang out a lot. And uh, Kerignaten. And this whole area here has a lot of stuff um, as far as markets, buying minerals. I think there's a lot of people put up buy orders for, for miners because miners will mine in this area. It's very safe. Lots of belts. Uh, 16. Look at these three ice belt areas in a row. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, an area with a lot of mining going on. And then um, again, over here, you're close to gel, which is missioning, but you have some ice belt here. And what I like about this one is you're, you're basically within three regions. Um, is that right? No, actually, I'm wrong about that. Uh, I thought this was more of a crossroads. It's not. It, it is if you follow these. If you go through gel, right, you're in sync liaison now. And again, that's a system that has a lot of uh, missions, but you also right near Amatar. So you can jump into Amatar uh, rather quickly. So it's a little bit of a crossroads, but not as much as uh, you would think. There was a time uh, when Dust was around, Dust 514, where systems uh, here, I forget which one it was, Nay, I think it was, was a Dust 514 system. So you would see in local, would be hundreds of players, but they'd all be in dust. They were colored blue and you could talk to them if you wanted to. Yeah, I do to. Okay, that's uh, that's good. I'll stick with that. All right, let's move on to some uh, some other stuff here. Uh, wrapping up, that is the snuff fight happened yesterday. Big fight, 400 billion lost. Uh, 240 of that came out of um, snuff. They lost an avatar. Uh, it's kind of a big deal. We'll see more stuff happening with Wrecking Crew entering this arena with uh, making alliances with Siege Green and stuff. There's a lot of trash talk back and forth between these two groups. No love loss. Okay. Uh, looks like uh, our friend... Oh, yeah. This was interesting. I don't know if you guys caught this, but there was a big tanker that got stuck in Suez Canal, I believe. If you don't know where Suez Canal is, let me see if I can find that real quick for you. And I'll show you some things that are kind of interesting to me. So this is a little bit off topic, but I, I wanted to just give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, in our public channel, I believe that's where stuff was being talked about. And yeah, here it is. So here is a tanker that got caught um, in the really narrow part of Suez Canal. And that is pretty big to give you an idea of how many ships are actually 
moving around in that region, there's this really cool website. Um, so we'll zoom in on this. And it shows you the shape of the ship. It looks like it's getting free, but you can see how it's stuck, right? And uh, there's tow boats all around it. This is live. This is live radar information or satellite information. So you can see there's tugboats uh, trying to get it loose because it's held up traffic uh, on this canal. Now the Suez is actually in, I believe it's the Middle East. Yeah, it kind of goes through. Um, it looks like between Africa and the Middle East. But I want to take a, take a quick look at look how many ships are like moving around the, uh, the world at the same time. This is not, I think this needs to go back for, let me refresh. Yeah, there's like tons and tons and tons of tankers moving around the oceans every minute of the day. This isn't even, yeah, it's, it needs to populate. I was stunned. I didn't realize how many. I took a snapshot of it when it's fully populated. It looks like this. That's how many tankers and ships are moving around. They're not just tankers. These are all kinds of ships, but it's a really cool website. Uh, I think they have one for airlines as well. I'll give this to you guys uh, in a minute. Okay, and so what's funny, and the reason I bring this up is there's a tanker that's stuck, right? There it is. It's massive. And you can see here's a little tugboat down here. See that? See that? That's a tugboat. So you can see how big that is. So CCP Fozzie writes, uh, topical EVE Online fact of the day, that ship stuck in Suez Canal is approximately the same size as a Mackinac. That's funny. So giant tanker is basically the size of a Mackinac. There it is. <laughs> I think, let's see, Suez Canal. Just to make sure we get, we get a good sense of how big that actually is. Because you have to see it, you know, next to other, whoa, next to other ships. That makes it look like it's fallen over. Crazy. Yeah, it's a big ship. Uh, I don't see anything that'll. Yeah, there's no there's no real size comparison except maybe this one. Okay, well there's your Mac. A little interesting fact for you. Okay, Friendship Week is here, uh, March twenty second through thirtieth. And uh, for EVE Online, get your account for an entire year, 12M, 12 months of Omega time, which is subscription to play EVE Online. That's a subscription level, Omega. 12 months of that, 15% off. That, I believe, is a pretty good deal. Subscriptions are generally the lowest and cheapest way of getting game time. And so this is 15% off the lowest way of getting game time or the cheapest way. You can always buy Plex, but, um, you know, you can also just subscribe for a year. So check that out. This is all part of other things that are going on. Let's go back to news. I guess it's the whole friendship week and there's other stuff going on as well. All right. I don't know if you guys saw this. This is an interview that happened. Um, it's, uh, let's see, the London Games Festival, LGF 21, had their con, basically, or their meeting. It's all done by, you know, like we're doing this now. It's all done by Zoom, although we're not using Zoom. But one of the speakers was... Uh, well known to us is the CCP Chief Executive Officer, Hilmar. And he was talking about uh, the metaverse and what the metaverse was and 
I encourage you all to watch this video if you haven't seen it already. Very interesting stuff in general, if you're into that sort of thing. But there was a few things there that are going to be controversial. I won't go into it all by myself because it's funner to share this kind of discussion with other people. But he talks about how I thought some of the more interesting things were um, how he sees uh, the game and the meta universe in conjunction to uh, the actual world, right? Because the meta is the actual. It's like a self-reference. Um, and so when you're when like us, where uh, I am a player of EVE Online, but I'm clearly not playing EVE Online. I am newscasting about what goes on in the game, what's worthy of recognizing as something interesting. And that isn't gameplay, but that is a combination of real world technology and uh, time and dedication. And that creates a meta narrative of what's going on in EVE Online because the perpetual universe is non-stop. He mentions that like Dungeons and Dragons is also a universe, but when the dungeon master closes his books and goes to sleep, that universe is paused and nothing is moving on. And uh, that's what separates these MMOs from other games is the, the dungeon master or the person who creates the world and the laws of the world uh, never takes a time out. The laws are written, the technology is turned on and stays on, and people come into the world to, get, to do the gameplay, and they leave the world. Uh, and then sometimes in between those two sessions, they will do other things like do negotiations over uh, some communication technology, and uh, that is what, what the meta is. And so he talks about that, but he also talks about how you know, and uh, like people will accumulate a lot of money. So he starts talking about, you know, what what virtual economies are like. Um, interestingly, he compares Eve Online to Iceland, and that more players play Eve Online than live in Iceland. And you can use ISK in more ways than you can use the Icelandic currency. So if you're going to use the Icelandic currency, you're going to have to exchange it, or it's it's only actually. To, you know, if you're in some other country, you have to exchange it, but it's only really taken at certain places, whereas ISK can be used in, you know, many countries of the world. So there's some interesting parallels between how, how impressive, I guess, uh, a virtual world is, especially in the age of Bitcoin, electronic, um, what are they called? Non-fungible, transferable items. Uh, these kinds of things now where, where you can put real value on digital assets. And Lord knows that EVE Online has a ton of expensive digital assets. So it's a, it's a really nice interview to, to look into that. So here are the couple of things that you might pull away. That are, this will entice you to watch it, but you should watch it for other reasons. But he basically says a guy that did the Eve Bank long ago made a ton of money in the game and then took off, cashed in that money, RMT'd it basically, and paid his uh, way to university or something. That's not actually what happened, but that's okay. We can, we can uh, forgive him. He was trying to make a point. Um, but he was saying like he didn't break any laws. But he broke the EULA, so he's out of our universe. But it's interesting he didn't really break any laws. And in a weird sense, Ilmar is kind of saying like, you know, RMT is understandable, that desire to do that. Um, and I, I almost felt like he doesn't really not like RMT because he wants RMT to exist for players as well. He goes out and says pretty much that saying he'd like to find like to see a way for players to really earn a living to feed their families and keep a roof roof over their heads by doing things in the game. So if you're a stock trader in Eve Online, he'd like to see they want to. He said they will, not want to, but they will at some point get to a point where you can play Eve Online as a living. And I thought that was an interesting long-term goal. And I don't disagree with him, uh, just because when you start making the parallels of the game universe, some, some people feel like we're just playing a video game. Other people feel like we have a hobby. Other people feel like we have social groups and a society. And there's multiple layers of interpretation of what we're actually doing 
when we play EVE Online. Um, but one of those is financial because their money goes into the game and, uh, and time is exchanged for actual money. So there is kind of an exchange going on. And if you ever played Second Life, you could put money into the game, but you could take money out of the game. And the reason CCP hasn't done that is because there's a ton of laws in different countries you have to obey. And so this, oh, once all that gets sorted out, then you can begin to work that way. I believe there are other games also where you could put money into the game and you could exchange it out of the game. And at that point, you have really a crypto currency, you know, it becomes a cryptocurrency. The problem with that, and the reason that the community team in the past has said, we're not there yet, that's not what we're endorsing. We want you to protect your investments, so lock up your accounts. The reason they do all that is because there's a lot of crime that comes with that. Cryptocurrency is full of criminals as well. And uh, you don't want things stolen from you that can instantly be taken without protections, without insurances. And, uh, and there's uh, also organized crime. That's really what they worry about. Organized crime trying to um, get rid of uh, launder money, just make it too, tr too hard to trace. So they move real money in, that's criminal money. They clean it, moving it through a cryptocurrency, and then they move it out into real money. There's no way to track to call that new money the same as the old money, and therefore it's laundered, it's cleaned. It's an ugly business. I don't know much about it. There are people who know a lot about it. I don't. Uh, but I wish, I wish that influence could be dealt with so that you could look at EVE Online in a way that it, it, it fully integrates into your life whether you make a living doing it, whether you make a living um, doing a lot of the things that, that people make a living in real life for anyway. Are you a manager? Do you manage in the game? Or do you manage in real life? Sometimes they require the same skill, the same charisma, the same uh, organization. Uh, are you an IT guy in the game? Or are you an IT guy in real life? Like what are the compensations? All those things, it's very mixed. The labor is already mixed. We run EVE Online as we would run our own company, our small mom and pop shop or, you know, big conglomerate. Uh, it's not to say that these guys can run companies because I don't know if they can, but but some, some do, right? Some are management. But the point is we're doing the same exercises. We're doing the same work. We're putting in the same hours. Uh, it's all there. And really, there's no there's no payback for it. Thanks to our Patreons, there's actually some money for us to like buy uh, software subscriptions and fund this thing. But that's thanks to charity, thanks to our tin cup that comes out. And every once in a while, we do a little bag and then you guys help us out. Some of you have been with us a long time. I won't mention names, but you can see them in red and uh, in different colors inside of our Discord. And those are the guys that are uh, providing us with flexibility to do things, to try things, that sort of stuff. Uh, but other than that, there's a ton of labor involved here. Like if I was, if I was uh, doing this for real money, it would be uh, pretty much the same effort because me personally, I put in tons of hours into this and the people that talking in stations all put in tons of hours, tons of research. There's tons of tracking things down, tons of talking to people, call people up and say, Give me a better perspective on this. We, uh, you know, seek out new sources. So there's a ton of actual work going on in this meta universe. And, uh, and if the game could find a way to compensate for that, you could feel a lot better for it. Because uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you the truth. When we're doing this stuff, the TIS stuff and other stuff, I'm sure other people that do other things feel conflicted. Am I spending too much time in my hobby, my video game? Should I be spending more time on my career? That's a big conflict. So if you want to watch that, it's a pretty cool video. I recommend it. And uh, that is uh, the metaverse with uh, Hilmar. So you should check that out. Okay. If you guys have any questions, I'll take a second to answer uh, anything. Otherwise, we'll call it a day and we'll be back tomorrow. I want to do some, um, I want to go back into mining and industry. We did a few of those shows and they're very popular. So we're going to do more industry uh, for the rest of the week. And we'll, uh, 
uh, see what's going on with our miners and see what's going on with our producers. Should also know that, um, oh, I forgot my point. I know what it is. I remembered it. Talking in stations has broadcast over a million views, a million thirty thousand as of yesterday in a one year period. That's one year, 365 days. One million views thanks to you guys. Uh, not necessarily the live crowd, but all the guys that watch it on YouTube, right? And that's just YouTube. There's all the live people that aren't counted in that. And there's all the podcast listeners that aren't counted in that. So we are reaching a lot of ears. And, and that feels pretty good. You know, it feels good. It feels like this is appreciated if people listen to it. Our comment section in YouTube has been really good for a long time. I love viewing it because it's really not positive. I mean, it's great. It's positive. It's very positive. But I love to see people adding to the story um, and talking to each other and that sort of stuff. So <laughs> somebody said that they were told to, to write questions in Talking in Station's YouTube channel because it is a resource for information. In other words, if you have a question about Eve, just go to Talking in Stations and write a question inside of chat and uh, it gets answered because, yeah, I do look at every single show twice. I'll go and look at all the questions and I will answer questions. So uh, the point is that it's a very good resource and I've never heard that it had the reputation of being kind of like a help channel. It's kind of cool. But yeah, over a million views, and that's mostly uh, thanks to all the work that TIS guys do over and over and over again every day. Okay, well, that is kind of all the news that we have today. So we will be back tomorrow. Oh, the Reddit thing. I did forget about that, didn't I? Well, let's take a look at Reddit. I think it's back. I suppose this one could be considered controversial because we're talking about the meta. It's a little self-referential, which I don't like. I don't know if referential is a word, but I've been using it a lot for a long time. I don't know if you noticed, if you went to Reddit today uh, for several hours, this whole thing was uh, set to private mode. And that was done by Reddit. I believe that was done by our Reddit admin and, or moderators, right? So here's a history about moderation of Reddit that I, and this is how I understand it. I think for, for more clarity, gibberish, who's one of the most active mods on Reddit or Eve actually can correct me if he, if he needs to. But the way I understood it was that there were guys that just kind of got the Eve online subreddit going early on when Reddit was going. And it was kind of a place that was very pedestrian, much like other people's or other video games is Reddit. In other words, questions would be asked, answers, not a lot of interplay uh, between factions or anything. It was really just a place of getting information on the game and that sort of stuff. Well, as players who are really into the meta and really into culture started populating Reddit and they played EVE Online, they started to look at the EVE Online channel and think, well, who are these guys that are moderating Reddit? They're not anybody notable. They're just guys that got it first. Well, a lot of pressure was put on them to have them basically say, they basically said, okay, okay, it's not our game and we just, we just got the title. So what we'll do is we'll look at a list of all the posters and whoever's posting the most and gets the most upvotes, basically. Like whoever's most popular in this Reddit can take over moderation and we'll see ourselves out. So it was essentially taken over by people who were the most prolific and upvoted posters. And that's where you get a Kriba, I think a Kriba, uh, you get um, Gorski, you get uh, four or five others that are just prolific posters. And then those guys decide who gets to be uh, a Reddit uh, mo mod too. So the Reddit is governed by people who are popular with Reddit years ago. And that hasn't really changed. Most moderators are dead. <laughs> they don't talk at all. They don't moderate. They're not even playing Eve anymore. Some of them, uh, not all of them. But you have one or two basically that have carried it for a few years, gibberish being one of those guys. 
And uh, I think there are some new moderators that are helping out, but uh, for the most part, it was basically very, uh, you know, they just, people just, uh, they do a lot of work. I've seen what happens in, in Reddit. There's a ton of stuff that's posted that you don't see that's just, just awful. And that needs to be taken out. So they do a ton of work. Uh, but they also allow whatever we have. So if you like Reddit, you like the way they're moderating. If you don't like Reddit, if you don't like its attitude, you don't like its freewheeling nature, that's a leadership problem with moderators because this could be like any other uh, any other game. So as a plus or as a minus, that's up to your way of defining it. This is what it is based on moderation. So these moderators... They govern this EVE Online, like our EVE. And what happened was today, and this is the scandal or whatever it happened, Reddit hired somebody that a lot of the Reddit moderation groups uh, did not like, or it's not did not like, but thought shouldn't have been hired and they uh, requested immediate action and it's taking too long uh, for this person to be kicked from Reddit or not you know employed with reddit or something along those lines i won't go into what they don't like about this person because uh, it kind of gets dark really fast but uh, they in protest said look if you're not going to move fast enough on this we're going to set reddits to private in protest so you're we're going to close down in other words we're going to close down reddit not just one channel many channels we're going to close it down to the public in protest for a few hours, and they did that today. So that is why Reddit was offline today. It was a protest against Reddit by moderators. It had nothing to do with EVE Online. And so this brings me to the analysis part of the program for this topic. And that is you have cross-purpose ties because EVE Online players had nothing to do with the outage. It was moderators' ethics and they leveraged EVE Online players' forum as a symbol against the employer or the, the actual group, the actual uh, technology. And so you have to start thinking like, is was that an abuse? Like, in other words, when a celebrity decides to talk about politics, they're told to shut up all the time because it's like, hey, I only listen to your music. I don't want to hear about your views. Just shut up and play your guitar, right? And we hear that all the time uh, because that's cross-purpose. Like, I, my purpose is to entertain you. Your relationship to me is entertainment. I'm crossing that purpose with my ethics, my politics, and I'm putting that through to you. And I'm mixing those so you can't avoid it. And that may or may not turn off an audience. There's been a lot of like cross-purpose things uh, happening. One of the most interesting one was when uh, Brisk Ball, everybody knows Brisk Ball, uh, was a CSM member. He was, uh, he was dismissed as a CSM member at one point because he was, it was said that he was uh, involved in leaking information. He denied that that was true. And they did an investigation and uh, decided that that was uh, reversible and they reversed it. And he was not reinstated because he had been, it was kind of at the end of the term, but he was, uh, they were took up the black mark off him and he was able to run again. And that's why he has a seat today because he ran again and he won again. But uh, when he was caught in that, that interesting situation, I thought there's some crossed wires here. And this is, this is where it gets interesting. So when Brisk Ball runs for office for CSM, he's a very open guy. I'm a very open guy too, and I appreciate that. So he says, hey, I am a lobbyist in uh, Washington, D.C. I'm kind of a politician. So he used that as a shtick, you know, and he did the great video that he did with his son. And it's kind of like he did a very political campaign for CSM. So it looked professional. Because he is a professional in that sense. He understands on a professional level what a campaign looks like. That's why it was so obvious to us that this guy is doing a campaign video. So there's a lot of reality leveraged into the game 
in order to appeal to players. It works. He gets the election. Um, he wins the election. But then when he gets into trouble, and again, he denied the trouble, and CCP totally reversed themselves on this. When he gets into trouble, the trouble reverberates right back to real life. And that's deadly because it's it, your actual self, your real self is exposed in a contractual situation with CSM. It's a contractual situation. You sign an NDA. That's a bit of a contract. That looks, when that goes bad, that reflects right back into your real life. And now you're a person who's working in a, in a situation of trust. And now there's a public uh, record of violating trust. And uh, that can't be, that can't be tolerated. You can't, you know, you can't let that stand. So <clears throat> that is why there was a, a strong move by Brisk to correct that situation, which was corrected. But damage is already done. But what you see there again is cross purposes. Leverage real life into the game. You get the position. The position blows up and it comes right back out. It's like grabbing a live wire. Um, it is. Uh, it was an unfortunate situation. Unfortunate that it ever happened because damage is done that can't really re be repaired. We all can laugh it off, but you know who knows, right? Who knows? Uh, real world, you you never know if that stuff follows you around for a while. So I felt like that was an interesting way of um, <clears throat> having um, having real life and Eve Online crisscross in a way that wasn't a good result. I think this is kind of the same thing. That uh, a protest for a protest to push the company to do something. I like collective action. I think it's great that people get together and decide we can't tolerate this. We're gonna we're gonna send a symbol. But you basically have a work stoppage. But more than that, right? Reddit didn't just do a work stoppage. They did a they cut off. They cut players off from talking to each other. That's not a work stoppage. That's a denial of service to Eve Online players in order to put pressure on a company that they disagreed with. And that to me is a little suspicious. I don't, it's not suspicious, it's just a little bit strange. I don't know how easy I am about that. I thought it was interesting though, and that's why I bring it up. Okay, now we're done. I <laughs> uh, hope you guys enjoyed the show. It is, uh, I can only go an hour, my voice actually starts to hurt, but uh, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me. I actually really like this where I can talk to uh, the audience and uh, let me look at some questions here if there are any because I think these are very interesting uh, ways of looking at EVE Online and our real lives and that's what we do at Talking In Stations more than anything else. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, Fonsue, I was talking about our EVE and again, uh, ethics aside, do you agree or disagree with their collective action? What I'm really looking at is, is the leverage, who has the power? Uh, is it is it a work stoppage? Is it or is it a denial of service? Uh, and is that fair? You know, like I don't know. Yeah, thanks thanks for watching, guys. Let's see. Yeah, I don't see any questions, so we'll just talk tomorrow. Again, we're going to go back into doing uh, some mining shows and some uh, industry stuff. Those were very popular for us, so we're going to go back. Talking in stations hit a million views in one year, 365 days. And uh, that's all you guys. So thanks very much for watching, helping us surface the show and uh, keep telling people about talking in stations. It's really great. We're in a great position right now with a lot of new people coming to TIS, a lot of new people uh, saying like, I wish I'd seen you guys earlier. <laughs> so tell people about talking in stations, give us up votes, subscribe. Um, Again, we're at 8,000 pretty much. We're getting close to 8,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, pretty much the same. Yeah, 7,800 in Twitch. Uh, all that is you guys, and it's us constantly showing up and doing stuff. Yeah, and make sure to like subscribe and do Patreons, and thank you guys for all the stuff that you guys do for us. Really appreciate it. Okay, that's it for today. We'll see you next time on Talking In Stations.